Hey everyone, welcome to Love, Rinse, Repeat, a podcast recorded by me, Liam Miller, he, him, his, a minister in the Uniting Church in Australia. Love, Rinse, Repeat is, is recorded on the unceded sovereign lands of the Gayomago people and I pay respect to their elders. Uh, my guest today is Peter Klein. Peter, welcome along. Thanks so much, Liam. Great to be here. So for those who don't know, uh, Peter is the academic dean and lecturer in systematic theology at St. Francis Theological College in Brisbane, part of Charles Sturt University. Uh, his focus research focuses on negative and apathetic theology, and he is also an artist, uh, which is exciting uh, and, you know, wonderful. So, Peter, let's just start with, you know, I, I ask this question from time to time to my guests that, you know, it's by no way is a fait accompli that anyone finds themselves in academic theology and, and systematic theology. And uh, so I guess part of my question, I guess, is, you know, how did you end up here? Was it something that you kind of you know, more fell into or just it's like, you know, a, a jumper with a loose thread. You just started pulling and you're like, this is very satisfying. Maybe I'll keep <laughs> keep tugging away. Yeah. So, I mean, I became interested in theology um, at a pretty young age. So it was really when I was probably 15 or 16 um, that I started reading theology. So um, I grew up in a really sort of devout Christian household was heavily involved in church, um, went to a Baptist private high school, and I had a teacher there who tried to start a debate club. Um, and starting a debate club from the ground up is actually really, really hard to do, as we <laughs> discovered. So the sort of debate club turned into let's just sit around and talk about ideas for an hour club <laughs> um, and he happened to be interested in theology and philosophy and just started giving us stuff to read um, and that was really the spark for me as a teacher in high school um, who just started giving me you know read, here read this stuff by Descartes read this stuff by Luther read this stuff by Calvin and from that moment on I was just kind of hooked um, mm. And it, it, from that moment on, it kind of became central to my understanding of myself as a person of faith to be asking questions um, and to be thinking critically and creatively about what it means to be a person of faith and what does believing in God mean or being part of the church or whatever. So, so yeah, that's kind of how I fell into it in, in high school. And then I knew that I wanted to go off to university to study theology. And I did that. And I spent a long time in university studying theology and then came out the other side. And here I am teaching it. So I think I... I think I, for my like 18th birthday, this is a funny thing, for my 18th birthday, I think <laughs> I asked my parents for a complete, for a, an edition of the complete works of Jonathan Edwards. I think that was my, I think that was my request for my 18th birthday. So um, I've since- So are you, are you, are you disappointed that t Twitter wasn't around at this stage and you could have been like, you know, uh, all over like, you know, edgy young theology Twitter, or are you now just like, dodged a bullet there like that i, think that I, probably, I didn't I, have access to that at this at that point in life yeah i think i probably dodged a bullet you know i've actually <laughs> never i've never taken the plunge into twitter um so i probably dodged a bullet yeah there, so. yeah no that seems yeah. that seems <laughs> accurate so so your theological education was was uh in the u.s you went to um wheaton and then princeton and then uh vanderbilt mm -hmm. uh and now you're teaching in in brisbane uh you know from where you'd rather be uh so um i think that's one of the old brisbane um I mean, it's just a card i'm trying to remember what the old when i lived in brisbane what the old taglines were for tourism yeah. up, up in brisbane and queensland but uh i guess one of the you know questions i'm curious about then is you know having that move what what were some of the things that either struck you when you first came or continue to strike you um coming into the australian theological context that potentially folk who've just been here um, might might take for granted. Yeah, so I mean, one thing is the sort of theological scene here is just much smaller. So mm. it's a much smaller scene here, um, and theological schools um, tend to be much more um, embedded in and run by ecclesial church context. And that's essentially how they're funded, right? Um, mm, yep. Because theologies are not, like theological thinking really isn't funded by universities, even though a lot of theological schools have these adjunct relationships to universities. So there's a much more kind of smaller ecclesial character mm -hmm. to theology here in Australia, um, as opposed to the sort of bigger university quality of 
theology done in the in the U.S. Um, and that's a, I mean, that's a, that's an immediate thing that I kind of had to figure out and navigate around and what does that mean and, and, you know, and I think both contexts have their strengths and their challenges, you know, so I mean I think here in Australia, the kind of drive towards sort of achievement and getting your name out there and being the sort of big, you know, big name scholar that just doesn't really exist here in Australia, like, because we're just, we just don't have that kind of mm. infrastructure that kind of drives the formation of scholarship and academic identity in those kind yeah. of like celebrity directions, which is very, <laughs> I think that pressure is very much part of the US theological scene, mm -hmm. you know, and that's, so that's a, that's a good thing here in Australia. And it means that there's less, less pressure in some ways. Yeah. So that's good. But at the same time, there, there's just less resources in some ways mm. less conversation partners um and it's just sometimes there's a struggle to um find uh people to talk to <laughs> i mean mm. on a really basic level <laughs> yeah so yeah. about various ideas or about the newest ideas or what's happening in the broader theological world so that's a struggle that, I, that i've encountered so yeah yeah I, i'm curious about that that point too is i guess like you know it, you know there's probably you know over in the u.s and um you know, more choice to go, okay, what institution is really going to be like pushing in a particular direction that I want to go? Like, I really want to, you know, explore queer theology, or I want to work with someone, you know, on particular intersection of Marxism and race and theology. And, and you could probably, you know, because of the scale, find not only individuals, but whole faculties, you know, kind of, which have, you know, somewhat more of a focus or, you know, an, an alignment in that area. Um, a kind of online friend, um, Samuel uh, Ernest, who's at um, Yale, he wrote a great piece recently, which was about like, you know, the, this kind of the new novelty of being, you know, a queer theologian being taught by queer theologians and that being this kind of somewhat new venture, but like, you know, that's able to happen in a number of places in the US um, because of, you know, again, that scale and that size and, and potentially also maybe some of that uncoupledness of, from, from the ecclesial setting um and so i guess yeah i think you know curious about that side of things with coming into australia how that both you know as you say that no not less pressure but potentially then things don't get maybe pushed into particular things as you know sometimes that push into well i'm going to explore something novel or new or more out there is because you know sometimes that's yes making a bit of a name and trying to carve out a space in a very competitive environment but i guess the positive is that space is then kind of carved out and and can be played in a little bit um how do you see i guess that ways of that being kind of i guess countered or or, or, or still happening in its small pockets in, in in the australian kind of scene or, or do you think that's something that is something that will just come eventually or um with just but it will just be a, a longer delay because of this sense of scale or is it just going to be uh you know always very different and that's also fine <laughs> yeah yeah no that's a, it's it's a it's a good question and um i mean my like you know my own kind of academic biography very much follows this sort of what i've what i've since learned moving to australia is such an american story of right. like leaving home to go study mm -hmm. you know um and picking the like like i knew that i wanted to go to wheaton college because it was sort of the you know, the best Christian evangelical school in the, you know, in the country. And then from there, I knew that I wanted to go study at Princeton because that's where the Bardians were, mm -hmm. you know, and I wanted to go study Bart and Bardianism. Um, and then eventually when I sort of had deconstructed a lot of that and moved beyond that, I knew that I wanted to go to Vanderbilt because Vanderbilt is this sort of home of critical theology where these mm -hmm. kind of lots of critical questions are being asked. So that's kind of that's very much my experience is studying theology, that kind of trajectory, choosing yeah. schools, moving around a bunch. <laughs> um, and, you know, and I have, you know, and that was a, and I had the resources to do that and the privilege to do that, right? Um, and Australia, the Australian scene is just not set up in that way mm. for various reasons, both culturally, um, you know, people don't often, people don't move to the other side of the country for a particular university, right? That's yeah. just not. Yeah part of Australian culture, it is part of American culture. So, so I think, you know, in terms of the, the ch meeting the challenge here in Australia of really, how do you create those spaces where 
the novel questions can be asked, the, the, the new frontiers can be pushed, the sort of same old curriculum doesn't just get repeated again and again, we open up new things. Um, I mean, I think that's, a, that's an ongoing challenge for us in, here in Australia. Um, and again, I don't have any sort of magic answers as to how to meet that. I mean, I do think, I do think that, that even post sort of pandemic and the way we've been learned how to connect with each other much more over the internet, mm -hmm. Yeah. can play a role. And that means that students who want to explore a particular topic, I think now have a bit more freedom and um, knowledge about how to go find a scholar mm -hmm. who's working in a particular area and say, hey, could we project, perhaps work out a project to do and would you be willing to supervise me, even if, yeah. even if it's at a distance, right? Yeah. yeah. Those kinds of things are becoming more possible as we become more, you know, used to connecting with each other like this you know mm. over the so i think that's one small yeah. piece but not insignificant um mm. and i but i but i do think it's it's about also sort of um and i think it's a task for theological colleges in how they do long-term faculty development mm -hmm. professional development and student development right how how theological colleges become a place where live creative theological thinking can happen right and that's mm. and i think that's a challenge is how do these small often under-resourced theological schools how can they invest in their faculty and future students to become and i think that's a challenge so yeah no yeah. thank you for that thanks yeah. i really appreciate that that response so um, one of the things we, we had talked about talking about was um, like theological anthropology and, and, and what it is to be human. You know, it's nice small questions, um, yeah. which, which is partly, I, I guess, um, was, was part of the reason I thought to do that was I know you're teaching that at the moment. You've been sharing in a couple of places uh, some thoughts on that course and, and on this. Um, so I guess to start with just really broadly, what excites you about teaching this kind of a subject? What, what you know, excites you about going like, you know, because um, I think people would think the very first thing if you said, hey, theology, people are like, ah, yes, about God. Um, and, and obviously these aren't distinct categories, but like um, in the way the subjects, you know, kind of work. But in a sense, you know, what is what excites you about theologically thinking about uh, the, the human person and, and, and helping others to think that way, too? Yeah, I mean, I think what is really exciting is I think we're living in um, the sort of time period in which we're living in is full of so many rethinkings of what it means to be human. Um, mm -hmm. And I think there's so many, there's so many from, from all kind of quarters and angles of the academy, but also outside of the academy, really kind of putting back on the table this question of being human and what does it mean to be human and how has being human been defined um, and how do we rethink being human in ways um, that are more helpful and liberative and hopeful and less awful? Um, and I think there's so many people who are invested in that project um, in both critical and creative ways um, that it's really just exciting to kind of step into that territory and introduce students to, to that territory. So um, that's what's exciting for, for me. And also just within the, within the theological curriculum, mm -hmm. um, Anthropology, it's a, it's a place in which I can explore some particular topics that I'm particularly interested in and kind of broaden some things out um, beyond simply some sort of classical topics and classical figures and bring in just some new interesting, interesting perspectives. So, and the way that I've, the way that I've kind of set up this class that I'm teaching is not to simply totally neglect what you might call the traditional questions of theological anthropology, right? Things like the Imago Dei or things like human freedom and free will or original sin or, you know, sin and salvation and all that, like not to, not yeah. to simply do away with those, but to kind of find different ways of getting at those questions mm. through topics and themes that are really of kind of vital contemporary certain interests so right. you know for instance i have a the, what i'm doing just this saturday and i've just been preparing for is a whole unit on sort of sexuality and gender mm -hmm. um, and through that lens you can actually get very much at 
some traditional questions around original sin, around yeah. the nature of freedom, around the relation of body and mind, um, all kinds of things, mm. you know. And, mm. You know, if you take it in a very traditional figure like Augustine, you know, he developed, um, he developed his whole, you know, notion of sexuality, embodiment, and gendered identity, if you want to call it that, in the same context that he's developing his notions of original sin, free will, nature and grace, all these kinds of questions. So, so getting at those questions from a, a, like a lens like gender and sexuality, I think yeah. it, it helps to kind of revitalize some of these traditional questions and open up new avenues of them. So um, same thing with a topic like disability um, mm -hmm. or a topic like race, you can, you can come at traditional anthropological themes and do it in interesting fresh ways so that's yeah. kind of why i'm excited to talk about like that and, and i do it and i way. imagine also you know theological anthropology is one of the subjects that probably most allows you also to really play with thinkers and voices from outside of the theological tradition you know because like, yep. you can just read people who are writing on sex gender race from, from any wide range of um disciplines and 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 backgrounds and commitments because you know it's like well how does this approach you know me, you know challenge complement uh open up or, or or things you know um what's been there and i think that that, that i imagine would be also you know an appeal yeah definitely yeah so it's just um yeah it allows a a range of things to be addressed and read mm. and, yeah so yeah it's it's definitely one of the exciting things about about the topic so but thinking about the sex and gender unity that's coming up i mean one, one thing i think i've gained from from some of the stuff I've, I've seen you post about it and write about it so like i've been reading i've been working slowly through again um marcella altos reads in decent theology recently from my own work and you know one of the points there is that like your know, theology has always been sexual um it's just not like it's hidden um or it's naturalized in a way that we don't uh, assume and kind of you know you kind of maybe touched on it a bit there with augustine working out a lot of this stuff in amongst this other thinking and so it kind of gets subsumed together and part of the work that we need to do now is point at where it is mm -hmm. um and then also point at what it's doing there and then why it needs to be subverted transgressed expanded um based on who we are and what we know now but it's it's this sense of it's not a novelty to think that theology and sex has something are connected it's mm -hmm. it's it's that's always been there what's maybe people think of as novel is the making it explicit and then also the the challenge to a particular kind of theological sexual project that that tried to set a, a, a certain kind of normativity mm. Yeah, that's definitely right. You know, and I so, and I and I think I'm trying to bring my students very much into that way of kind of viewing it, right? That this, you know, to think theology and sexuality, or theology and gender together, you know, it's not just some thing that's happened in the last fifty years or whatever, right? <laughs> like it's as right. This is this is Marcella Althaus Reed's point: is that theology is always sexual and gendered. Um, so yeah, I'm trying to bring my students into that, um, and yeah, and, and help them both. Well, like help them help them really just fully register what I would call the sort of ambivalent, the deep ambivalence of the Christian mm. tradition on mm. this point, at, uh, like on lots of points. Like um, <laughs> yeah. you know, like I mean, again, to go back to Augustine, who's such a you know central figure in a lot of these a lot of these conversations. Um, and I'm trying to get introduce my students to him and how he plays a role in so many of these conversations. But, you know, like, like Augustine is such a fascinating figure for so many reasons. Um, and he has, you know, really interesting and really problematic views on human sexuality. Um, you know, and his, I mean, his position is basically that what we, what we would today call sexuality and everything that goes with that sort of human experiences of sexuality desire pleasure arousal all that kind of stuff for augustine and he develops this in the city of god all of that is basically a punishment for original sin right like mm -hmm. like god because we disobeyed god god punishes us with our bodies disobeying us right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in sexuality so he, and he has this really kind of and therefore sexuality is something to be constrained avoided regulated defined right so there's that whole side of Augustine, which everyone loves to hate, right? Um, 
which is, I mean, fair enough, right? Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but then there's this other side of Augustine, and it's it, this side that I call sort of his spiritual eroticism, where, you know, you read a text like Confessions, you know, and he's, mm. and he's sort of narrating, you know, his conversion to Christianity, but you, and you get this in Confessions, but also in so many of those writings, there's this also, there's this deep eros that, 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 survives in Augustine, right? Even you know, that survives even all of his condemnations of eroticism. Mm. There's an eros that survives in Augustine. Now he he sort of transfers it onto God in a way, right? God becomes yeah. Augustine's erotic object. Um, but that I just think something like that points to these ambivalences mm. of the Christian tradition. One, how Christian tradition has always been like a sexual gendered yeah. discourse. Um, but how there's, it's also pulls against itself, right? And it also, mm. you know, it tries to, it tries to confine and to sort of, you know, um, manage sexuality, but it inevitably, the sexual nature of theology s- spills out in all kinds of ways that <laughs> it doesn't confine. So just getting students oriented to that, you know, yeah. and getting them to read theological texts that way that there's always something sexual going on in theological texts, mm. uh, whether the authors name it as such or not, right? Yeah. It's just getting them attuned to that way of thinking, I think is really important. Have you found, because I think this is a question that probably not only relates to those who do it in the classroom, but potentially those who do it in churches and other contexts, have you found what things you've learned in how best or not best to help walk students toward that. You talk about you know, helping them introduce them to this way of thinking, to get them to notice it, both in the tradition and to maybe be not, not immediately thrown off when it's more explicit. Like, um, yeah, how do, you, how do you find that? Cause I'm sure, you know, for many it's, 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 it is, it's it's like very visceral, like, oh, <laughs> this is getting too much too fast. Cause you know, yeah. this when, you, when, you're, when you're near the presence of God. Um, so yeah, have you found things that you've found help this process or hinder it? Uh, that, that yeah in your, in your experience yeah i mean uh, you know i i regard myself as a very much still a beginner when it comes to teaching you know i've been i've been now teaching you know in this you know kind of full-time capacity for sort of five years now and i you know i i'm still very much a beginner right so all that to say i don't have any you know i don't think i have any grand wisdom about how to best <laughs> teach, teach these things um but it, but it is a question that I'm really invested and interested in. Like, how do you teach um, these sorts of, in, around these sorts of areas and bring students into these conversations in ways that is helpful and nourishing for them? And that doesn't either just sort of turn them off or continue the sort of wounding around these topics that has been, you know, prevalent. Um, I mean, one thing is that, like, I just think it's important to model normalizing conversation around these things and and to mm. do it in and to do it in ways um that are you know yes earnest but also light and playful in in various <laughs> kinds of ways i think that's one thing that i try that i try to do um but also just also just giving but also i think just giving a lot of space to students to find their own way into it you know what i mean and mm. and really trying to not talk at or preach at students about these things, but invite them into something, you know? Um, you know, I, I remember a, when I, a, couple, a couple years ago, I, I was teaching a, a master's level course on sort of theology in a global context. And I, mm-hmm. one of the texts that I assigned was Marcel Althaus Reed's book, Indecent Theology. Mm-hmm. And I remember one student wrote to me prior to the, prior to, the class session, which we were to talk about that text. And the student was just super, super anxious because they had read this book mm. and they thought that what the class was going to be was that students needed to come to the class and be prepared to kind of talk about their own sexual right. lives. Yeah, yeah. And that this was just like, this was really, really like anxiety provoking for the student. It was like, I, I don't think I can do this. I don't mm. like, I read this book and it's very explicit and very, and I just, so just, and that was an important moment of learning for me, like to, mm. to realize their students, even if they want to learn about these things, it raises a lot of anxiety, right? And these, mm. are, these, are, these are very vulnerable, you know, parts of human existence, right? So mm. just to be aware of that, you know, and to, you know, and to always reassure students, like 
you find your own way into this conversation and you never have to, you know, um, participate in a way that you don't want to participate, you know, but also in keeping it open, right? Like I, I want to yeah. invite you to make connections with your own life. If that's something you feel comfortable with or to process things or so it's a tricky space, you know, yeah. um, that I'm still very much figuring out. Mm. But I think what, uh, you know, comes through there is obviously the, we were focusing on this aspect, but this is also going to be, you know, for, for students, you know, when, if you come to talk about, you know, race or disability, you know, it, it's got, you know, you're, you're touching on true lived experiences and things that often have been, whether explicitly or implicitly said, we don't talk about that or that's not, you know, needs to be discussed. Um, that, yeah, there is this, you know, that I think what you say there of having that opening of if people wish to make those connections with the times that they have experienced racial injustice or profiling or the experiences of their own disability or disability within um, family and friends and what that, how that has been theologized, you know, in their growing up, like that's having that space that people can actually wrestle with that and, and start to see other ways of, uh, of exploring it and naming it, um, you know, is, is such a vital vital thing that the classroom can offer when, when, when done really well. Yeah, definitely. You know, and again, to stick with sort of sexuality and gender stuff, and this is something that the theologian Mark Jordan mm. makes a lot of, or really helpfully, helpfully articulates um, in a lot of his writing and speaking, is that we, like, we don't even, we don't have a form for teaching Christian sexual ethics. Hmm. Like, we, we don't really have a sort of, what does this even look like? What does this even feel like? What like, what is what is what is Christian theologizing around sex and gender supposed to look and feel like? We just, and you know, what he articulate is part of that's because we're living in what he calls the debris of Christendom, right? We're living in the sort of aftermath debris of Christian ethical systems around sex and gender, and we're basically wandering around a wreckage, trying to figure out how do we put something back together? What what yeah. what does it even feel and sound like? And I think that. You know, and you know, and he makes a lot about that. Like queer theology is still very much in its infancy. It's mm. still very much even finding the forms through which to ask its questions and to make its, you know, thoughts and all that kind of stuff. So we're just we're kind of living in that disaster zone, you might say, <laughs> around these areas. And so it is. It's just it's a it's a lot um, to try to orient yourself to and to, and to find a way forward. And it's all we're all just experimenting, you know. Mm. Um, with what, what, what this means to teach this stuff and to reteach this stuff and find a way yeah. in. Yeah. yeah. Shifting gears slightly. So, so when I read your bio before, you know, there's that, you have this folk, I've had a research focus on negative and apathetic theology. Uh, I guess, you know, we've got to have a range of folk listening to this. For some, that will be a very new kind of idea. And I'm less asking you to give us the what is that and what's, <laughs> what does it mean? But more what, I guess, was it that drew you to it? Uh, I guess particularly maybe drew you to it in the in the in the picking up the debris and the debris of your um, Bartian uh, uh, you know time uh, whether it came directly out of that or whether it was further along but I'm, I'm curious what what kind of um, yeah what, what was it that appealed to you and has remained appealing about that kind of theological mode yeah I mean I think if I think in terms of my journey and academic and theological and personal journey. I mean, I think apophatic theology came in for me or became attractive to me at a particular point in which a lot of what I had sort of built up and constructed as my theological, but also sort of faith view of the world was coming apart mm. um, for various reasons. And it was, Apophatic theology came along for me as a way of saying and affirming that all our theological systems, all of our theological thoughts, all of our best theological work is at best experimental and provisional and gesturing at something that it will never be able to capture. So mm -hmm. it's actually okay if things fall apart. Um, <laughs> and that doesn't mean that you have to stop even believing, right? Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't mean you have to stop thinking. Um, if you find mm -hmm. that you've run up against the limits of your own ability to articulate something or your own ability to work out mm -hmm. something or, or existence becomes more than what your theological 
system can handle. Um, apathetic theology is a way of saying, yeah, you should expect that, right? Like you, you should expect you, you, and it's a good thing to encounter the limits of your ability to articulate and master the life of faith, God, being alive, being mm. human, right? Like apathetic theology creates a space in which that's okay and can be worked with and played with and yeah. accepted. That was what it, that was for me. In particular, I would, if I would point to a particular thing, it was a particular experience of going through a particular kind of interfaith religious group um, at the end of my seminary experience, um, this mm. sort of Jewish Christian dialogue group where Christian students and Jewish students, I was part of this group for a year long dialogue group and then we traveled to the Holy Lands together. That, that experience was a really kind of visceral experience for me mm. of of breaking apart any kind of easy theological view of the world, right? Like mm -hmm. suddenly encountering difference at a very intimate level. Um, and how, what does it mean to do theology in conversation with that kind of intimate difference? That was a really huge moment for me. Mm -hmm. And I think in the wake of that, I discovered apathetic theology as something, um, as a space and as a style of thinking that could bear with that. Mm. Yeah. Oh, that's really, that's, I like that a lot. Well, Peter, this has been a really, really fun conversation. There's so much more we could talk about. So we'll have to have you back on the podcast at some point. But uh, is, uh, as we kind of land the plane, is there anything you want to promote or draw attention to uh, folk, that folks can read or that um, or, or upcoming classes they could get involved in or yeah, anything you want to kind of uh, promote or you don't have to at all? <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, like, I'm not sure I have anything in, in mind uh, to promote um just that uh that kind of i think this kind of theological area and is is a really kind of rich generative space to be thinking in um and i'm really grateful to be there yeah oh well, that's excellent so well folks thanks for uh listening and peter thank you for joining us and uh, we'll see you all next week bye-bye thanks Liam.